Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. We are taking a break this month. While we do so, we invite you to revisit our previous episodes. We continue this week, this month's throwback, with episode 14 with Dr. Brian Roth. Similar to the episode with Dr. Graciela Pinero, I also recorded this one in my car in July 2020, and it was a very hot afternoon. Join me and rediscover Brian's fantastic career journey. This episode has been the most listened to episode in 2020. I can't wait to check back in with Brian for another episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we revisit this episode, we are excited to share that the Dr. GPCR Ecosystem 2.0 platform is now open. Although we plan on opening the ecosystem slowly to resolve any kinks as soon as possible, we invite you to visit, visit us at ecosystem.drgpcr.com, register as a site member for which we will approve you, and explore the new site. As you know, access is restricted to members of the GPCR field, and each signup will be approved based on the involvement in the field. When you sign up and you get pre-approved, you'll be able to enter the ecosystem. You'll also have the option to select a plan and get access to all things Dr. GPCR, including the upcoming Dr. GPCR Summit in October, access brand new podcast episodes before they get released to the general public, uh, access our new group discussion and forums, the job board, our learning center, where you'll be able to take or create and share a course, and also discover GPCR companies and much more. Take advantage of everything that the new GPCR dedicated online playground has to offer today by visiting ecosystem.drgpcr.com to start your GPCR journey. This is the only place where GPCR scientists, trainees, and GPCR organizations can thrive and where it's only about science and GPCRs. Think ResearchGate meets LinkedIn meets Amazon. Also, make sure that you mark your calendar for the third edition of the Dr. GPCR Summit. This year, the summit will be held between October 10th and 16th. Stay tuned as we are working on the 2022 summit program. Visit drgpcr.com to find out more about all of our activities. And now, let's dive into this episode. Uh, welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of having with me Dr. Brian Roth. He is a distinguished professor at the Department of Pharmacology at UNC Chapel Hill. Hi, Brian. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Greetings. Good, good. I'm, I'm happy to have you here today. Yeah, it's great. Great. Awesome. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. Um, so I briefly introduced you. I think the GPCR community knows very well who you are. Uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your trajectory as a scientist that led you to where you are today? Uh, yeah, so um, it's it's actually started when I was uh, when I was quite young, uh, and I, I've mentioned this before in interviews. Um, so uh, a member of my family had schizophrenia, and their first uh, first psychotic break was when I was, um, I don't know, five or six. And, uh, you know, this had a huge impact on me at the time. And, uh, I would say from the time I was probably in eighth or ninth grade, um, I decided that, uh, what I wanted to do was be a psychiatrist and study, uh, come up with uh, new ways to treat mental illness. And um, the the other thing uh, around that time was uh, it was it was sort of the tail end of the '60s. So I, I grew up in Montana, so we were we were buffered from a lot of the things that were going on in the 1960s, but not entirely. And uh, I also got interested in uh, you know you could you could see basically people that would take take uh, psychoactive drugs they would have these this this huge effect on them. And uh, so these two interests basically uh, converged um, when I was an undergrad uh, in Montana. Um, there was a, uh, so I went to this really small college in Montana. There were, I think, a total of 1,100 people, 1,100 students 
in all four years. Uh, so very small and, uh, you know, no research going on. Um, but it was good for pre-med. Uh, and uh, at the time it was, so I, I was clear, this is, I wanted to study the brain. I wanted to study drug action on the brain, but there was, there was no, no way of doing that coming from a small town in Montana with no scientists. And so I decided, well, I'll go to, go to medical school. Um, and uh, the last year or so, we had a visitor, visiting scientist from University of Oregon who came in. I think he was um, actually coming, it was uh, in the spring, I think he was probably coming to Montana to go fly fishing. And uh, cause we have this world famous, uh, uh, you know, trout streams basically all over the Northern part of North, Northwestern part of Montana where I was in college. And uh, as part of his uh, so sojourn, he gave a lecture on neurotransmission. And he discussed the concept of receptors. And so that was around the time that uh, radio ligand binding technology had been invented by uh, Saul Snyder uh, and Candace Pert. And I said, that's what I want to study is receptors. That's it. I'm going to study receptors. I don't know what they are. They sound really cool. So, <laughs> so that was the start. And then uh, I got into medical school. Um, what I tell people is after a day or so, I realized I had made the biggest mistake of my life. And I wasn't really sure if I wanted to practice medicine. And so I started looking around for other things to do. And it, it turned out there was somebody in the biochemistry department who was studying receptors. And he was, he was basically the only person in the entire medical school studying receptors by a guy by the name of Carmine Kasha. He's now, now retired, uh, but fairly well known in the opiate field, opiate receptor field. And uh, I said, I want to study receptors. <laughs> Can I work in your lab? And so he let me work and I, you know, spent all my, basically all the time I should have been going to classes working in his lab. And uh, then uh, finagled my way into the MD PhD program and, you know, ultimately got a PhD on opiate receptors and, you know, then I was hooked. So, and, you know, at the time, you know, it's interesting to think about this. So this was in the, in the early eighties, late seventies, early eighties, there was debate at that, in that era, believe it or not, whether receptors were proteins and and in particular, whether the opiate receptor was a protein, because nobody had ever purified it. And there was, there was actually a group of investigators uh, who said the opiate receptor was actually cerebricide sulfate, that it was a lipid. Whoa, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> that was my next question. So if they thought it, was, it wasn't a protein, what was it? Right. So th there was this debate in the field. Is it, is it, a, re is it a protein? How many, you know, how many opiate receptors are there? Are there, you know, there was pharmacologic evidence for at least two or three. And um, so it was a very wild time. And, uh, you know, the idea of G protein coupled receptors was not, not a concept at the time, basically. It wasn't until uh, rhodopsin was cloned and then uh, beta receptors were cloned basically by homology with rhodopsin. Uh, that that it was realized by um, by the folks in the Lefkowitz lab that this was this was a huge family of G protein coupled receptors, and then you know ultimately opiate receptors and other receptors were cloned. But uh, um, it was it was sort of a wild time back then. You know nobody really knew. We didn't really know what was going on. Um, I was in the biochemistry department and. Uh, I think half of the faculty thought what I was studying was an artifact because I couldn't purify it. Uh, but I published, you know, a nice paper in JBC, uh, which at the time was a, you know, a pretty, uh, pretty good journal. Still is a great journal, but at the time was like a really, really good journal. Um, and so they gave me my PhD, and you know, that was it. I was hooked. I've worked on them ever since.
So that that makes my question: What is your favorite GPCR obsolete? Clearly, it's it's opioid receptors. Actually, not. Uh, so uh, what I so um, I started out studying opioid receptors, and uh, I won't mention any but any any names of of people living or dead. But at the time, that field was was populated by a cast of very colorful characters, I'll just put it that way. Uh, and there was a lot of, you would go to these meetings and there were, you know, there was a lot of people yelling at each other. Uh, <laughs> because there was this competition between were, them. Well, they didn't agree, you know, was was this, this subtype of receptor a real subtype? And there was this idea actually that one subtype of opiate receptor was coupled to guanine nucleotides and another subtype was not. Okay. Okay. This is all before <laughs> these these receptors were cloned. All before they were cloned, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and lots of other crazy stuff like that. And uh, so I decided after I got my PhD, I never wanted to study opiate receptors ever again in my life. Uh, that changed, you know, some years later. <laughs> But it was basically because, you know, these people, they seemed like they were crazy to me in some ways. They were just, they were clearly very passionate about their research, but um, it was just, there wasn't a lot of data. It was, you know, it was just, I think, you know, this class is not coupled to GTP and this class is basically. Um, and people would argue about whether the data was real or not. So, so um so I, when I did my postdoc at the NIH, I started studying serotonin receptors. Um, and it turned out, the, as luck would have it, the receptor that I study, that I started studying, turned out to be the receptor for psychedelic drugs, which you know I was very interested in their actions. And also uh, the receptor for many uh, uh, therapeutic medications, so atypical antipsychotic drugs, um, and some antidepressants, and so on. So just by dumb luck, I, I happened to uh start studying a a receptor that ultimately has turned out to be you know interesting and important but but through no no particular effort of mine and just dumb luck i would say so <laughs> that's great that's great yeah. um getting back to to the era of dopamine receptors and all these uh incons <laughs> inconsistencies in the field so you had right. mentioned that at that time radio ligand binding was the brand new hot technique to measure receptor function, what were the other techniques, or were there any other techniques that people were using to at least measure the effects of, of receptor activation? Yeah, so um, when I when I was a, a graduate student, there really wasn't anything else um, other than binding assays, basically. Um, so um, uh, Gilman had you know, Al Gilman had worked out this uh, cyclic AMP binding protein assay to measure adenylate cyclase activity. Uh, and uh, after I had finished my PhD, uh, I did a, it wasn't a formal postdoc, but sort of a semi-formal postdoc while I was, again, while I should have been doing other things related to medicine. Uh, and I discovered the secretin receptor. Uh, and uh, we did that by radio ligand binding. And then there was a, uh, a scientist there, Lynn Hallett, who had come out of Al Gilman's lab, who had brought the adenylate cyclase assay technology with her. And we showed it was uh, GS coupled, basically. So um, I tell all the people that study family B receptors that they should remember that I, I'm the person that actually discovered the first family B receptor. <laughs> I published one paper on it. Uh, and uh, from a neuroblastoma cell line and, you know, showed it was GS coupled. Um, but that, that actually the cyclase technology in, in those days, it was for reasons that are not entirely clear. It was, it was difficult to, to do. It was, you know, required this double column thing. Yep. Uh, I've done, I've, I've done, I've done some, I've yes. done some. Uh, Interestingly, yeah. when you had to, you know, starve the cells, load them with tritiated um, tracer, they would uh, make the tritiated cyclic AMP that would then uh, lyse the cells and run 
the cyclic AMP were produced on, through t- two sets of columns. So we had one set, you ran your lysate, you washed, and then you put the second set on the second column, and then you collected something uh, that was right before uh, the EPAC breath biosensor came out of Michel Bouvier's lab. And uh, I th- oh, I, or I think before, in between those two, we had this, um, this kit that didn't necessitate using all these columns you could um, you had this charcoal method, but I, I do remember that it was a, quite a pleasant experience having to yeah, steal those columns. Yeah. yeah, luckily Alain did that um, for us, so I didn't have to do it. And then when I was a postdoc, I basically discovered um, uh, or was part of the discovery of metabotropic glutamate receptors. So I I sort of in the I was in Herminio Costa's lab. And at the time, there were 50 postdocs in the lab, so it was this gigantic lab. And uh, my project was to develop uh, phosphoinositide hydrolysis as an assay system, which which was just it was basically a pathway that was just being discovered. And so, so I did, and I and I showed that serotonin, some serotonin receptors were coupled to it, uh, and then uh, we discovered metabot- basically metabotropic glutamate receptors, other receptors. So. So, um, uh, so then we had basically two sets of assays. There was for functional activity, um, other than organs in organ baths, right? So I actually did some of that research as well. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there was just radio ligand binding, and then and then at least you could measure what we now are know our GQ coupled receptor activity, and then the GI and the GS. Um, but but even then, uh, so this was the eight, you know the eighties. Um, it was it was a for reasons that that are still miss I would say st- still mystifying to me. So I was trained as a biochemist, so it was fairly straightforward for me to develop these assays. Um, but for pharmacologists, it was it was magical. I think to some extent. <laughs> It was just just a different. It was a different era, basically. You know, <laughs> that's very far away from the you know plate based three eighty four well plate assays. Yeah, three eighty four or fifteen thirty six. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You get yeah. so much data out of one plate that you ha- you can play around for a week unless you have some bioinformatic magic. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Things that. have changed a lot. Yeah. yeah. So it's the eighties. You're at NIH. You're working on uh, on serotonin receptors. Right. What next? You're an MD at this point. You had you MD, can... MD PhD. MD, okay. Yeah. So I, um, so I was so uh, since I was poor in medical school, I uh, I got quote unquote a scholarship from the Navy to pay for my MD training. My PhD training was was you know I got a graduate fellowship, um, and so I went to DC, and I was. Uh, I then had to pay the Navy back. So I was, uh, I did a year of a psychiatry internship at Bethesda, what was then Bethesda Naval Hospital. And, uh, you know, when I should have been sleeping, I was working in the lab at the NIH, <laughs> basically. Um, and then the Navy let me do uh, four years of research as payback. Yeah. So I continued uh, doing some work on serotonin receptors. Um, I ultimately had my own lab uh, in the Navy, basically across the street from the NIH. And then um, uh, also did work on, uh, since it was the military, they, they wanted some military applications. So I studied uh, septic shock, which was a uh, you know, frequent cause of injury and death in, in military personnel. And actually studied receptor um, uh, receptor desensitization and uh, functional selectivity. So yeah, so I wrote a review article in uh, '87 uh, on uh, laid out the case for GPCR functional selectivity using serotonin receptors as a model system. And uh, the idea that I sold the Navy was that you know there are these multiple pathways. We didn't know about multiple G proteins at that time, and. But it was clear that uh, that uh, you know receptors could couple to multiple signaling events, and I said, um, "Well, you know, we can make a drug that activates this pathway and not this pathway, and you know maybe this pathway will not be desensitized, and so we can come up with a drug that's better for sepsis than than what we have." And so, 
So, um, you know, they let me work on that. And uh, I, um, I learned some molecular biology along the way. And so that was, that was very helpful. I published a book on septic shock and uh, sort of became a, uh, uh, one of the world's experts uh, in that area. And then I left the field <laughs> when I was done with my time in the Navy. <laughs> back to, back to uh, GPCRs and, uh, right. yeah. and working on that. And then after that, you got your position at, uh, at UNC at yeah. the Department of Pharmacology? No, no. So, so then I, I went to Stanford um, and uh, finished my psychiatry training. Uh, it was clear to me at the time that uh, uh, I was not going to make it as a scientist. Was not, there was no way I was going to get a job as a scientist, basically. Um, that's, that's at that time, that was clear. Okay. Uh, my, my publication record was just not particularly strong. And, um, and I actually wasn't ready to run my own lab either. I was, I needed to, to, to grow up. Uh, so, um, I decided, well, since I'm not going to make it as a scientist, since, you know, I may make it as a scientist, but it's not clear that I'm going to be able to make it as a scientist. I better have a fallback here. Um, so, and I was always interested in psychiatry. So I went to Stanford um, to do my psychiatry training. And uh, I would say as is typical of me when I should have been sleeping, I was uh, working in the lab, learning <laughs> molecular biology. That was my um, next question. So at yeah. Stanford, did you ever get to work in a lab? But I guess, yes. Yeah, I did. I, I wasn't very successful. Um, but uh, I was, you know, it, it's funny. Um, so I, I tell this story to people. So I was so uh, unsuccessful as a scientist at the time that uh, I, at the time when I was in training, I got a fellowship. Um, um, because my, the guy that was mentoring me was head of the selection committee. And it was a, uh, it was a very prestigious fellowship uh, the Dana foundation fellowship and at, you know, at Stanford university. So it was a big deal. And every year we would bring in a uh, famous scientist to give a talk. And then he would meet with all the Dana fellows. There were, you know, five or six of us there and give us advice on how to be successful in our careers. I won't, I won't mention the name of the person, but he's, he's a really famous scientist. Now, um, I like to joke, I think I have more citations than he does though. Um, but, but at any rate, when he, uh, <laughs> when he met with me, he said, Brian, I'm gonna tell it, basically, I'm gonna give it to you straight. You're never gonna make it as a basic scientist. He said, <laughs> he said, you've never, you've never published anything important and uh, he said, based on what you're doing, you're not going to publish anything important and you should just give up now. Basically, give it up entirely. You're never going to make it. Um, he did say, I, it's possible that I could run clinical trials for a pharmaceutical company, though, because I knew pharmacology quite well. And, you know, I could, I could make a comfortable living and, you know, be involved in some interesting stuff. But uh, the chances, you know, I should just forget about basic science altogether. It's there. It was just not in the cards for you at all. <laughs> Goodness, I've, I've heard stories like this and, and yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I'm glad you, you didn't, uh, you didn't listen to that, that advice. I was too stupid to listen to him basically is what I tell people. So, <laughs> so I did. Uh, so by then I had, I had my, uh, you know, my clinical training was done uh, and I went to Case Western. So Case Western Reserve University, uh, the psychiatry department hired me um, and they gave me a lab, which was about as big as your car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> Maybe slightly bigger, <laughs> but about that size. And, uh, and then my job was to um, basically run a clinical ward. So I, you know, was interested in schizophrenia and I ran a uh, schizophrenia uh, research and clinical ward for many years uh, until my lab finally, you know, got off the ground, basically. Um, and um, when I was, uh, when I was starting out 
uh, at Case Western, it was very, very, I tell people it was very, very difficult for me to get started, extremely difficult, because I didn't have a, any, any publication record of note. And uh, I, I couldn't write grants that were interesting to anyone. Um, so the first grant that I submitted, um, so this was in the era before they had triaging of grants. So now, you know, 50% of the grants are triage. So my first grant would have been triage, but they gave me a score because they, they didn't have triaging then. But basically the, um, so I, I subsequently I found out who, who it was that, that reviewed it, um, but I, I won't say their name, but um, uh, basically said, you know, the same thing that I was told at Stanford, this person has never discovered anything of, of note. And based on what's in this grant, we'll never discover anything of note in the future. <laughs> so pretty, pretty, pretty rough stuff. And uh, so I called the program officer and uh, at the NIH who was handling the grant. And he said, you know, Brian, maybe you should consider a different career other than science. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and still you didn't listen. <laughs> I did not listen. No, because I, I just really loved working in yep. the lab and what I was doing. Um, and, you know, all these receptors were being cloned and it was it was a very exciting time. In this is in the, in the 90s, early 90s? The 90s, yeah. Yeah, early 90s. So lots of, you know, all the receptors were being cloned. And, yep. you know, it was it was really fun, a fun era. Um, and. Uh, you know, I submitted a revision and it got a big, actually got a better score. It wasn't good enough to get funded. Uh, and my program officer said, don't ever send that grant back to us again. They don't want to see it again. <laughs> oh, goodness. Was it about GPCRs? Yeah, it was on, it was on, it was structure and function of serotonin receptors. Wow. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think you were ahead of your time, probably. Yeah. Yeah, so molecular modeling, mutagenesis, I proposed, you know, we'll purify the receptor, try to crystallize it, this sort of thing. Um, and my chairman actually said to me that I wasn't going to make it, basically. You know. So I sent it in a third time. We got a 5.4 percentile. So a very good score. Okay. That's a good score, right? It's a very good score. Okay. It's an, it was an awesome score. Uh, they felt they felt sorry for me. Um, <laughs> they just didn't want you to submit it a fourth time. They didn't want me to submit it a fourth time. They didn't <laughs> want to have to see it again. Um, and uh, they didn't fund it. Wow. Uh, because they said they, that year they were only going to fund the top 5%. Oh. So I was at 5.4. So I knew somebody in another institute and told him my tale of woe. And he, he said, well, I can't handle this. But he said, I know somebody in the institute that, you know, studies receptors. And, yeah. you know, they, they funded up to like 20%. So they were happy to take the grant. And then I got funded. And then, you know, I've been funded ever since. So, That's yeah. So it was very tough. Very, very tough for me. Really hard. Yeah. But you persevered, and that's because you were, at least from what I can hear, very passionate about the science. Yeah, I love, I love doing science, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I didn't listen to what anybody said. <laughs> yes, yes, sometimes, sometimes that's also very important. You can listen to what people have to say, but you still have to do what feels right. And especially when it comes to something you're passionate about. Yeah, yeah, and I got lucky, you know. There, there is also all, all, all the time that component, but I think being able to not give up at the first try is also very important. Yeah. 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 So how did you end up uh, at, at UNC? So, uh, you know, when I was at, at Case, you know, uh, things started going well, and I ultimately moved to the biochemistry department, uh, became a full professor there. Um, and then... Uh, uh, my daughter uh, was ready to go off to college, and uh, my wife said that she didn't want to live in Cleveland anymore okay. because she was tired of there not being any sun. So 
in Cleveland, there is no sun. Basically, it's it's it like ninety percent of the time is cloudy. A little bit like Montreal sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so she said she basically said something to the effect that you know she said she's going to go someplace sunny and I can follow her. <laughs> So I was actually happy at Case Western. Things were things were you know great, and people were very nice to me, and I had lots of friends, and you know the research was was going well. Um, and uh, then Gary Johnson from UN. So I let people know that I was looking to go someplace that was sunny, and Gary Johnson, who was chair at UNC, basically just called me up on the phone, and he said, "I'm going to give you an offer you can't refuse." That's what he said. Wow. And he told me what it was, and I said, "You're right. I can't refuse that offer." <laughs> so they gave me a really good offer, uh, and uh, you know, it's sunny ninety percent of the time down here, and wow, very nice. So, um, can you share some of the details of of that offer? No, I can't. No, no, I can't. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Well, at least I got, got I got an endowed chair. Wow, that was nice. Yeah, that was really nice. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And you got the sunshine. And I got the sunshine, yeah. And we moved into a brand new building, mm -hmm. uh, research building, which is beautiful, um, just spectacular. Uh, and, you know, I've had lots of fun here, lots of great students, great postdocs, great colleagues. Um, you know, so it's been lots of fun. That's fantastic. And since, uh, so for the past decade, what would you consider as your favorite receptor or family of receptors? So it's usually whatever one we're working on uh, at present. Um, uh, so I, I actually got back into the opiate receptor field, <laughs> as you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we solved structures of opiate receptors and all this stuff. And, you know, that was, I would say, um, getting the first structure, that was, you know, huge. Getting our first structure, that was really big. Because it was what I was always, I, you know, as as I told you, I was interested in drug action at receptors, yeah. and really wanted to see what this looks like at the atomic level. And um, so when we started getting those structures, that was that was just amazing, and it continues to be amazing. I mean, we have so many structures now that we're we have that we're writing up. It's just uh, it's just incredible. Um, Great. And it was and, a special month last month. Um, I put together this newsletter on a monthly basis, and I think we counted eight or ten papers. It just came out just in June. Yeah, to do with structural uh, cryo EM or, or structures. Yeah, various yeah. different areas. Yeah, yeah. And the, the field has yeah. been booming, structurally speaking. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and then uh, structure based drug discovery and all this stuff is is just it's been awesome uh, uh, to really really be part of that. Um, we're doing a lot of work on serotonin, a, a lot of work on, so I have a huge lab right now. There are about 30 people in the lab I and saw. probably 15 are working on serotonin receptors. So we have a huge, a huge effort on serotonin and dopamine receptors. Um, and then, you know, all the other receptors basically. So we study them all. Um, but, uh, right now we're, we're really interested in serotonin receptors uh, in particular and dopamine receptors. So, yeah. More the structure function relationship uh, of these receptors, or is there any clinical context in which you're? Yeah. So the idea, the idea I've always had, uh, I would say, which is not a novel idea, uh, was that if we had the structure, that would be helpful for for developing better medications. Um, and so the the idea always is that once we get the structure, uh, then uh, uh, we use it for um, for drug discovery purposes. So most of the structure studies are there's a, a component to you know solving the molecular determinants of bias, bias yeah. signaling, or functional selectivity, and then using that information to uh, inform drug design and ultimately therapeutic drug discovery. Um, so we have, you know, lots and lots and lots of projects with, with those, those sorts of aims. Um, 
we do some animal studies. So, you know, I have a big lab. There are probably three postdocs that are working with mice. So, you know, so we have, I have a big mouse bill. Um, and we just, uh, just a paper just came out in Nature Neuroscience uh, earlier this week. So I invented red technology and that, you know, that of course is really, really taken off. Um, so we have a new ligand that works in mice and, and in monkeys and, you know, works as a, as a pet ligand and uh, will, will be very useful for translating that technology going forward. So, um, you know, just lots of things. Um, I'm telling, I, you know, we have so many projects ongoing now and I have so many collaborations that I, um, I've, I've had to tell uh, people in the lab to, um, uh, when they, when we have lab meeting to uh, uh, remind everybody once again, what their project is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <pretty> people, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely send out notes the night before so that everybody can get a chance to read yes. project. Yes. <laughs> what's this project you're working on again? <laughs> so in the context of the serotonin uh, receptors, you're looking at structure function relationships, understanding structurally how the receptor works and you want to develop better drugs. Right. What are you looking for exactly in this context? What so, are the benefits of the current drugs? Yeah, so one of the one of the most I would say one of the potentially most amazing projects we're working on is I just got this big grant from or award. It's called a cooperative agreement, technically from DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Which um, they're notorious for coming up with impossible ideas that will be revolutionary. So. Um, they came up with this idea, uh, I think in part after seeing one of my talks. Uh, so there, a um, little bit of background here. So uh, certain psychedelic drugs uh, like psilocybin and LSD are, are showing really amazing efficacy for treating depression. So um, psilocybin actually in the US is in phase three clinical trials and has been um, given breakthrough status by the FDA for treatment of depression. And basically, uh, a sing people take a single dose. Uh, you know, they have this profound uh, psychedelic experience, and then their depression is gone, basically, um, for weeks or months. So they follow these people for up to six months now, and most of them are depression-free. Interesting. Um, so one so time... One time, one dose, okay. Now, that's great, but you're taking a psychedelic, right? Not, every, not everybody can take a psychedelic and those are not without their problems. Um, so the idea is, can we make a drug that is not psychedelic, that has the same therapeutic effectiveness? Okay, so that's the idea make a non-psychedelic psychedelic. Got it. A biased okay. non-psychedelic. A biased, yeah, bi basically biased, a drug that's biased for particular signaling pathways that are therapeutic and not psychedelic, okay? Can we do that? Well, we can make biased drugs, yes. Can, but <laughs> that we can do. <laughs> Will they be therapeutic? We don't know, so. Um, so it involves, you know, solving structures, doing uh, structure guided drug discovery, um, you know, optimization, a huge amount of chemistry, um, and uh, you know, animal studies, basically. So it just started. Uh, we we just did our six our six week uh, report. So we're six weeks into it. So, uh, but it's it's moving along. It's moving along amazingly well. So. It's great. And do we know if the psychedelic activates differential path signaling pathways at the uh, of the serotonin receptor? I, I I can't give anything away, but but I don't know. Are you a, have you ever watched this show Billions? Uh, no, it's funny because my husband was watching it just last night. Okay, so the 
one of the main characters in Billions has this phrase. What is the phrase, Judith? I am not. I am a monster. No, I am not uncertain. I am not uncertain. Right. So, so the the venture capitalist or or um, uh, investor uh, has this phrase that he uses when he has inside information on something that no one else has. And he says, he'll say, I am not uncertain. <laughs> okay. Okay. Got it. So you're not uncertain. <laughs> I am not uncertain. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> there may be data out there that's unpublished that we have, that we may have in our possession. So that we are the only people in the world that have in our possession. So, yeah, I think, um, so certainly, certainly we can make drugs that are biased for any pathway. Okay. If you have if you have sufficient medicinal chemistry resources and appropriate assays, you can make a drug that will do anything basically. Um, and uh, the the question though is is the pathway the one you want? Okay, right. That's that's the question. And I'll just say I'm not uncertain about that. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, it's it's a, it's a big big question in the field. For example, yeah, you know, with the opioid receptors. When for quite some time people thought, well, you need to activate GI but not beta restin, and then you'd get the analgesic effect but not the side effects, and now right. doubt that it's not as clear cut. Yeah, it's not, um, and I, I think a big part of the problem is we don't have very good tool compounds. So the the compounds, so all the drugs that people say are quote unquote biased, uh, in our in our hands, they're not particularly biased basically. Uh, and we, we actually have published this, uh, sadly, in the supplement of our paper. Um, but it's, you know, it's published in Nature. We, we, we show that they, you know, if you, if you do the assays with GRK and all, you know, all, the, all the things that you need, then none of the drugs are particularly biased to any, any great extent. Um, and and that's the case actually with a lot of the so-called biased ligand programs, the or functionally selective ligand programs. The the, the compounds never were particularly biased, um, and so really, and there are lot, lots and lots of these programs out there. It's not just you know virtually every every receptor has a story uh, related to that. Um, but I think. Um, you know, we've been hampered to some extent because a lot of the assays aren't, aren't particularly good. The, you know, we've actually moved entirely to Brett technology. I've, I've become a real fan of Brett technology. <laughs> I'm a fan too, so I yeah. agree with it. So. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was one of these technologies that, you know, it just seemed difficult to do. I don't know why that is. I think part of it was the readers weren't very good. Yes. Right, you would agree with that? Yeah. 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 Readers weren't very good and depending on some readers, sometimes you had trouble measuring the fluorescence if the cells had right. autofluorescence and then it just messed up the signal and but I think it's this, it's a beautiful technique because you're looking at a ratio. Yeah. It's and, ratio metric. It's yeah. great. I, yeah. I, I, I love it. I, yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So we uh, the readers now are really good. Um, so I won't, you know, I'm not going to mention any brand names, but, uh, we just got, uh, a reader, um, that we do, uh, 380, 384 well played in 45 seconds. Wow. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Compared yeah. to old school readers when you needed three minutes to read a one time, the, the 96 well plates. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And usually... So with with the with the old reader, we usually have to measure the would have to measure the plate five times. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because it just wasn't very stable. Exactly. So now now you can get a very stable read in less than a minute for a three eighty four well plate. Yeah. And uh, we're buying we're in the process of buying another another um, amazing uh, piece of equipment. That will read a 384 or a 1536 well played in two seconds. 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> well, and, and then you need a whole bioinformatics team to process the data as the, it comes off the... the yeah, paper. yeah. So I, I, you know, I have dedicated people to analyzing data. But uh, yeah, so, and it's, and, uh, you know, we've optimized, uh, we put a lot of work into optimizing sensors uh, so that they have better dynamic range um and stability and that and it's it's basically i consider it definitive <laughs> definitive definitive assays now you know and, yeah and they're easy in the sense that once you have the best dynamic range possible you have you know the the ratio <laughs> figured out then you just have to put it in your cells and then throw any possible compound you can think of at it right read it and then um, you know, process it kind of like a, in a factory where you can gather a lot of data in live cells. Which yeah, really yeah, cool. yeah, in real time. And, yeah, exactly, exactly, which I think is really wonderful. And there's, and not, a lot of, there's not a lot of downstream amplification. No. Either. So it's, they're, they're great assays. Um, you do need a specialized reader, though. That's the, that's the problem. You do, yeah. you do. I, I consider it, um, well, you do need a specialized reader, but I do consider it, once you get the hang of it, to me, it's an art of yeah. doing these experiments in a way that, you know, you can, as a lab person, you know that it takes two minutes to do this, and then it takes five seconds to plop it in, and then you can plan out how many compounds you can run in the next hour, because right. everything is <laughs> like clockwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... Then, I, I, tip, I tip my hat to Michelle Bouvier every time I see him. I say, because I was, I remember I, I went the first GPCR, the, you know, the, the Canadian GPCR meeting or Great Lakes GPCR meeting. Um, I, think he, I think he unveiled that probably in 2004. It was before he published anything on it. Yes. And at the time he said, Brett, bioluminescence, resonance, energy transfer. And I said, wow, this sounds really cool. <laughs> And we went back to the lab and tried it, and we didn't have a reader. We had basically a spectrofluorimeter, and we were trying to, you know, adapt it. <laughs> and I said, ah, "This That's is just true. not going to work. <laughs> How That's do you get this?" <laughs> definitely not the best. Uh, that. The machines have have really caught up, and it's uh, yeah. it's an amazing technology. I I love it. Um, so I'm. I love it too. I first encountered it. When I was so I was working at the Saint Justine Hospital affiliated uh -huh. with the of Montreal, and I was in Nicolas Sivikar's lab. We were working right. on receptors, but we we're heavily collaborating with Michelle's lab. Right. And uh, it was the time where I was shown how to do the column purification of cyclic AMP. Oh, really? <laughs> in Michelle's lab back back in the day with the postdoc of his. Right. And then this biosensor came out for us to measure cyclic AMP. But before that, we were measuring, uh, we were collaborating with them, measuring homo and heterodimerization of right. CCR4 with CCR2. Right. And uh, I was following one of his postdocs who showed me the art of Brett. Um, and I was hooked since then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great technology. I love it. It's, it's awesome. Um, so you use it, I saw that you had a paper come out with all of these G-protein tools, biosensors right. to use. And you use you usually look at G-protein activation using BRET, or what are the other BRET? Uh, G-alpha and, and arrestin. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to, you know, my my sense is that when, so a lot of this is devoted to, you know, ultimately creating bias ligands. And so we want to get as close to the transducer as we can without getting downstream. Um, and so we want to get that initial event. Uh, and um, the nice thing about the both the Arrestin uh, Brett and the, and the heterotrimeric Brett is that they, they capture basically that initial event. Um, they, they're relatively insensitive to receptor reserve, which is amazing, you know? So, um, so we, we think for analytical, uh, type studies, uh, there it's the way to go. Um, so we've, you know, 
you know, we, we still do lots of second messenger assays, but uh, it's mainly, you know, most everything is, is basically Brett or um, for screening, we use Tango. So we developed this, uh, we can screen all the GPCRs in the genome in a single 384 well plate using, using the Tango technology. So we use that a lot for screening. And of course, uh, Flipper um, calcium for screening as well. So they're fast. Um, you get a lot of false positives with them, but it's, you know, it's fine if you have a... I was going to say, the calcium assay is a tricky one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fast. Um, and uh, the, the thing about screening though is um, you really want to, you want to assay that has a high signal to noise, which calcium does and the tango assays do really high signal to noise. Um, and the penalty you pay in screening is not the false positives, it's the false negatives. So uh, those are lost forever. So it's better to have an assay that, you know, picks up false positives so you don't, you don't throw anything away. Because um, you can always, we can always, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our stuff is automated, basically. So it's, um, you know, a single postdoc typically would do 100 plates in a day. 384 well plates in a day. So just stack them up, the robot runs them. So running the assays is not a problem. We have, you know, machines that load the buffers and all that stuff. Um, so we we just want to make sure we don't, we're not missing anything. So we can, we'll accept a little bit of noise on the front end if as long as we have, you know, assays like Brett, which are very, very specific, very sensitive um, to um, validate those those actives down the road. That's fantastic. You you seem well. You have a big lab, but you also seem to have a very um, organized and very compartmentalized set of tools that allow you to gather the information as soon as possible and also process it to, yeah. get, to get to where you want to go. Is which is understanding how these receptors actually work and possibly design drugs that would do one thing but not not another. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and it seems to work. I'm sorry? It seems to work. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. Great. One of my questions was, do you think GPCRs are still a good target? Obviously, they are. What yeah, do you, they're great. What do you think the they're challenges are at this point in order to develop better drugs, targeting GPCRs, and faster as well? So, um, so I actually get this question asked a lot by people in the biotech and pharma business. Mm -hmm. You know, so... So yes, they're great targets. They're druggable. Um, Accessible. Um, the the problem always is um, is not in making the drugs against GPCRs. So what I tell them is, you know, if you have a a pathway, this, you know, if you want a pathway specific drug, you can get it. It's it's not it's not it's not difficult. We've done it many times. Uh, if you have sufficient resources, uh, you know, primarily medicinal chemistry, uh, the assays now are, are really good. You do need someone there that that knows something about GPCRs on their team. That's very helpful. You have somebody that actually knows the field. Um, the problem, though, is uh, deciding the indication, uh, so the therapeutic indication, and the target. So. Um, the problems in drug discovery uh, these days are not because you're not getting sufficient chemical matter. So um, we can do that. You know, we can solve structures. So we're doing this now. We're solving structures. We're synthesizing new drugs. Then we're solving a structure with a new drug in like three weeks' time. And then, and then we're making modifications of the drug and doing the iteration again. By you know by cryo, so um, you know it, it's it's resource intensive, but it's um, it's uh, you know it's it's doable. The problem still comes down to though you have to choose the right indication, um, and that requires knowledge of biology that you probably don't have. Okay. So that's that's the problem I think. You know, the reason that so many things fail is, you know, not because a chemist didn't do their work, 
um, but because the hypothesis was basically wrong. The idea was if we make a drug against this target, it will be useful in this disease. And, um, you know, that, that just may be the wrong hypothesis. It typically is the wrong hypothesis. Um, and I don't know of any, of any useful ways of deciding how to, how to connect the, the disease and the target, the disease and the therapy target. Okay, so this, is, this continues to be the problem. Um, my, what I, what I tell people is, and this is my, you know, my belief still is that every GPCR is good for something basically, right? If we make a drug against any GPCR, it's going to be good for some disorder. Yeah. We don't know what that is. <laughs> exactly. That's the problem. Sometimes we don't, we don't understand the biology, the underlying biology of that pathology. Right. And, and also the the um how much that gpcr contributes to that right right I, I was talking to someone earlier this week and we were talking about depression and actually it was more uh, i'm sorry it was migraine and the problem is that most likely the brain of people who are suffering from migraine has a different biological landscape compared to someone who doesn't have migraine yeah so we're getting these recept gpcrs in the context of migraine is more difficult because you, you don't understand fully the biology of, of what's happening in, in that environment. Right, right. And uh, that's usually not what a drug company wants to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. I mean, I don't think anyone wants to hear that. <laughs> oh, you should, you know, create a bias ligand for beta rest and, and at this receptor and all your problems will be solved. All your problems will be solved, yes. All side effects, <laughs> most importantly. In, instead, I would tell them you need to spend 10 years finding out what the biology of this condition really is. Um, exactly. So they, they don't want to hear that. Um, the other, so that's one issue. The other issue is that for, you know, complex diseases, uh, which are the most common diseases, uh, you know, the ones that I, I'm interested in are neuropsychiatric diseases. Mm -hmm. So schizophrenia is a, is a really good example. The genetic landscape is so complex that it's, you know, it's a drug that hits a single target is, you know, not, never going to be, you know, the best drug, basically. Yeah. You're going to have to make drugs that hit multiple targets. And they don't want to hear that either, basically. Uh, you know that's not what that's not what the chemists want to hear. Um, but in fact, the you know the drugs for for um, for schizophrenia, in particular, hit hit multiple targets. And for most, uh, the ones that are most effective hit many targets, um, like fifty. And wow. uh, clozapine being the most effective, at least fifty targets. And and for other complex diseases. Uh, you know, typically people are on multiple medications, basically, that are hitting multiple targets. Uh, and so the idea, if you could combine, if you could make a multi-targeted drug, that would be great. Um, and, um, you know, then the question is, what mix of targets? Which ones do you want to hit? Which ones do you want to avoid? This sort of incomplete knowledge. Um, I must say there has been some success in that. So. We, I published this paper in Nature now about five years ago with this brilliant team from Dundee, Scotland. Uh, uh, it was uh, automated design of ligands to polypharmacologic properties. So a really beautiful paper. Um, and they have, uh, they now have a, uh, a biotech company, um, Accentia, yeah. in, uh, in Britain. And they're doing great. I mean, they're, they basically, industrialized, uh, you know, uh, designing de novo drugs that hit defined molecular target groups of molecular targets. Yeah. And um, that's, that's working amazingly well. So I think, you know, I think that will be, will be really important going forward for complex diseases. Of course, the problem always is what targets to hit. And, you know, we don't, we don't really know that yet to any great extent.
from patient to patient, would there be any variation? Would it yeah. be the same way patient A versus patient B? Uh, that's also something that needs to be uh, needs to be further studied. Yes, that is a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> Not all all drugs work the same way. On, yes. on this, even if the patients have the same diagnosis, you never know how how their uh, their bodies would would react to that. Yeah, yeah, it's a big problem. <laughs> but I guess that's, that's another problem. That's one I'm not tackling. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's uh, that's that's another problem for 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 another day. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask. So you had mentioned that before before you became successful and you got all your grants, um, you know, most of your grants approved. You went through a series of of disappointments. What would be your advice for junior scientists who want to contribute to the field, but don't necessarily have you know ten nature papers coming out of their postdoc? Uh, so I never looked at it in in the sense of contributing to the field. Okay, that was never my that's never been my goal actually to contribute to the field. Okay. Um, my goal, uh, you know, as, as I think, I think was clear, I love being in the lab, basically. It's just so much fun. And I love looking at data, as my wife, who's listening to this, can, <laughs> can, can, you would agree with that, right, Judith? Yes. Yes. I love, I love data. I, I love looking at data. <laughs> it's my passion. So it's what I really love to do. And uh, I'm just fortunate that, you know, through luck more than anything else, things have worked out. Um, you know, the only advice, the only advice I give, I give people is, you know, sort of trite, but it's, it's all I have, is that it, find out what you love and then try to do that. Find the thing that you're really, really passionate about. Yeah. Find that. Find whatever that is and do that. Um, I re and don't pay so much attention to the outcome. It's the it's the doing that's that's more important. Um, when you know when I when my lab was uh, was struggling for money and you know it was you know it was difficult to see how I was going to keep things running. Um, I was just really excited about every little bit of data. So I I just love looking at data and. Late, you know the latest structure or whatever they they can't people in my lab cannot send me too much data so um i'm just fortunate i would say i'm fortunate that i found something i really really like to do and uh it's it's not work for me it's just having fun every day is is a vacation day in the lab for me um, that's the way i look at it so um if i could give any advice to people i would just say try to find Try to find what that is. Um, the chances of any one person having an impact in science are so small that um, you know I I that has never been <laughs> my equation at all. Um, and you know if we've if we've done things that are that are useful for other people that that make their lives better, either as scientists or ultimately the world's population that that's a great benefit uh unanticipated benefit of what we do um i would say so that's all i can say is you know i wish you luck and um you know have fun have fun in the lab <laughs> yeah it, it is it is true i mean as long as you do what you what you like to do yeah you end up not working a single day in, in your life right and right. and if the goal is the goal is important, the way to get to the goal is also very important. It's an adventure. At least that's that's the way I see it. Yeah. My goal has been to have fun in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> and you've you've done it well and you you still you still seem to have, have fun. lots of fun. <laughs> Which is fantastic. Um we talked about the different projects that you've worked on. And the discoveries that you've made were there any moments um, during that time that you discovered something or you encountered something in the lab or uh, within the scientific field that you can characterize in, as an aha moment and if you could tell uh, 
Yeah, so there were there basically have been two. Um, so a lot of a lot of what we do is sort of discovery historically has been discovery based research. Um, uh, so non hypothesis generated research, and we do that basically because I'm really bad at generating hypotheses. So my hypotheses usually are either wrong or they're trivial. Um, so, uh, but I would say the first, you know, the first sort of thing that that was sort of mind blowing to me was when we. So there's this this uh, plant hallucinogen salvinorin A. I don't know if you know of this no. salvia. So there's this hallucinogenic plant people smoke sometimes called salvia, and um, nobody knew how it worked. And so we discovered it was a kappa agonist. Wow. And um, uh, when I discovered it, um, I had gotten the compound from this guy who was selling it on the internet. <laughs> okay. okay. And uh, so uh, I told him that it was the kappa receptor. And he said it cannot possibly be the kappa receptor because, as you know, kappa agonists cause dysphoria. Okay. And I said, well, you know, I said, I've been in the opiate receptor field and they were, they're known to be hallucinogenic as well. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I'm going to disprove that it's the kappa receptor. Okay. So he told me that what he was going to do was to inject himself with naloxone and then smoke the stuff. Okay. <laughs> and I told him not to do it. It's not a good idea. I said, this is a bad idea. Yes, you could die. And he did it anyway. And the next day, he sent me an email saying, you're right, it's a kappa receptor. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, goodness. so I brought everybody in my lab to my, um, uh, to my computer, and I, and I showed them the email, and I said, read this. I said, this is the only time in your life you'll discover something, you'll discover the molecular target of a drug on Monday, and then on Tuesday, it will be validated in the human. <laughs> human trial. Yeah. <laughs> The human trial will be that that night. <laughs> well, I'm glad he survived. <laughs> he survived, yes, and of course, it's subsequently been validated as the kappa receptor. So that that was, you know, that was <laughs> that was a pretty amazing thing. Um, the other thing was when we when we solved the first GPCR structure in the lab. Uh, that was that was amazing to me. Um, so I I had seen so I. You know, with working with Ray Stevens, uh, I'd worked on many structures up until that time. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd, you know, seen the structures and all that stuff. But to actually get it done in our lab was, that was huge for me. Um, so that was, that was awesome. Um, an awesome experience. And every receptor that we solve or that, I, or that I'm part of now, they're all were like really cool. Each one is, is, is amazing just to see, you know. Where this amino acid is, and that one is. <laughs> you kind of close your eyes, and at the end of the day, know which which amino acid is where. Depending yeah, on. yeah, yeah. It's each one is different, and they're all you know they're all little beautiful snowflakes. So that's that's lots of fun for me. Do you celebrate when you get a structure out? Is there any way you uh, you commemorate these? No, we probably should. Um, when we get. You know, when we get a good, a big paper that's accepted, we usually have a part. I throw a party for the postdoc, basically. That's great. Um, but uh, no, I probably, you know, I probably should have, but we just never have done that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's 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 time for a new tradition. Yeah, yeah. After COVID, we can have parties. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. At the moment, it would be a Zoom, a Zoom a beer hour or a Zoom party. <laughs> you could have a bottle of champagne delivered to. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should do that. Yeah, it's a great idea. I probably should. I mean, for the postdocs, it's it's such a reward for them because getting these structures is like it's it's the most complicated and difficult thing in the world, is what I tell people. It's it's incredibly difficult to do, and um, particularly to get a good structure. And just getting the structure for them is is like huge. So just to have, they don't need any. They would probably like to have a party, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be, you know, and 
I'm pretty sure it's not an additional incentive to to get the structure out, but it would be a great way to uh, close yeah. the chapter on, on that structure. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. My last question uh, for you, Brian, today, if you have any job openings, do you usually post them somewhere? I need to mention that we do have a career page, Dr. GPC. Oh, okay. Career, so if you have any positions to advertise. Oh, great idea. The goal is to gather in one place all of us who love GPCRs, who work on GPCRs, so that people who have jobs openings can find the right candidate not throw these ads out in the universe and hopefully oh, that's that's a great idea so i should i should um so uh you know i would say jobs are potentially open all the time okay in the lab um uh and uh you know people should just contact me um even if i don't have a position now so typically when people are applying they don't you know they don't need a job today okay uh, they're they're looking at you know there's a student they're looking to do a postdoc at some time in the future, um, so things it's a big lab things open up, people get jobs basically, um, so I would just say um, you know right now I'm not recruiting anybody but who knows you know tomorrow you know there are a couple of people ready to be on the job market and from my lab, and uh, you know as soon as they get positions there will be positions opening up or you know, a year from now, you know, something would open up. So I just say, you know, just contact me. Um, so great. So I didn't know about this. So I, I'll, I'll remember that. Um, so can you send me a yes. email about that? That'd yes, be great. I can. Yeah. I can. Yeah. The goal is to have as many, as many job postings out there as possible. Um, we're also scouring the internet. Um, industry jobs, which are very difficult to find if you want to continue yeah. working on GPCRs, but they're, it's not impossible to, to find them. They're difficult, but not impossible. There are some out there. There are. There yeah. are some out there. Um, but yeah, that's the goal is to, to have these as, as, as much as possible on, on one place, on one site, so that people can kind of shop for the best job that they're interested in. And this way, um, you know, PIs and also companies can, can find the best candidates. Yeah, yeah. So I know this company, Accenture, is looking for people. Um, it's the UK, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. I met uh, at the last... Yes, at the last GPCR retreat, I had met uh, Kate, who was in your Kate, lab. Yeah, 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 Kate, yeah. And uh, she, she was presenting her poster, and she told me that she was in your lab, and she's, uh, she's at the company, and she seems to very much love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they recruited my last two students. They recruited directly out of my lab. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and picked them. <laughs> and picked them, yes. Stole them from my lab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll check that. I'll check out their website too and gather the information for those positions. But I will also email you with uh, with a link and uh, how to. I know. I know. So companies uh, periodically contact me as well so okay. um, I'll, I'll let so i'll i'll forward i'm not going to say this information over the over the internet but i'll yeah. i'll forward it to you yeah yeah i can we can cut this this part uh, at the end, so. okay all okay. right okay all right uh thank you so much brian for being yeah. here it yeah. was a great pleasure chatting yeah uh we'll talk to you soon thank you yeah bye bye great service bye. thank you Thank you for joining us and listening to the Dr. GPCR podcast. I'd like to thank Dr. Brian Roth for joining me. This episode was listened to over 500 times in 2020. Thank you also to our team members, Attila Forrest and Ines Pinero. You can become a beta tester of the Dr. GPCR ecosystem today by signing up at ecosystem.drgpcr.com. Also, we invite you to subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter Find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. As always, you can email us with questions and suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.